Good evening, St. Rest. How blessed of God we are to share tonight again in Bible study. We will continue in our series, Let's Work Together. Tonight we'll have an overview of Nehemiah chapter 3. Nehemiah chapter 3. And really we will have our theme be our lesson tonight. Let's work together. Nehemiah chapter 3. Let's pray. Uh, we'll read part of the scripture and then we'll dive into the lesson and see what God has to say to us. God, our Father, we honor you and bless you for who you are. There is none like you. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for the privilege to study your word in safe environments. We don't take this privilege for granted that we are in a space where we can freely hear what you have to say to us without any hindrances, without any harm or danger. God, we thank you for the freedom we have to study your word and hear how it is important to our lives and what we need to learn in order to do better as you've called us to do so. As we study your word tonight, God, show us those things you'd have us to see. Speak those things you'd have us to hear. Teach us what you'd have us to learn so we can be who you've called us to be. More importantly, do what you've called us to do. Even now, Lord, sit Michael down. Allow them to see and hear Jesus, not me. Allow your word to go forth with both accuracy and clarity, that your people be edified and you be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our time together, again, we'll have an overview of Nehemiah chapter 3. For the sake of time, I'll read the first four verses uh, to get an idea of how this chapter is written. Nehemiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers and the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel, and next to them the men of Jericho built, and next to them Zakur, the son of Emery, built. The son of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts and its bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired. And to them, Meshulam, the son of Bereshiah, the son of Meshezabel, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Benah, repaired. Basically, this entire chapter, you get these verses where it tells you who repaired what part of the wall. The entire chapter, as it runs 32 verses long, it gives you insight to which individuals or which priests or which sets of men repaired parts of the wall in Jerusalem. As we discovered last week in chapter two, Nehemiah gives out the clarion call to tell them Jerusalem lies in waste. Let's build the wall so we no longer have to suffer derision. We no longer have to suffer embarrassment or shame. So in chapter three, it gives us full insight to who was responsible for the rebuilding of the wall. Now, as you read it on first read, you would think that there is nothing of note in the chapter because it reads like those Old Testament and New Testament books where it tells you this person begat that person or this person begat that person. And in those chapters, it's not as interesting because all you're doing is reading this list of individuals who took part in some type of project or in some type of lineage. But the Bible reminds us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction, for correction and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or thoroughly equipped for every good work. God didn't just write something for nothing. All scripture, every verse from Genesis 1 and 1 to the end of Revelation gives us context and offers purpose. So if God wrote it, there's meaning to it. And even as we look at Nehemiah chapter 3, although it is not as interesting because you may not find principles as easily as you would in other scriptures, there's still something for us to learn in Nehemiah chapter 3. And as we look at the 
chapter in its entirety, it gives us tips on working together, some helpful hints on how to work together for the cause of God's will. When you look at the individuals involved in rebuilding the wall, they came together for one purpose, rebuilding the wall and honoring the will of God as it was laid out by Nehemiah. And really, that's a lesson we can learn from them as we continue on learning to work together. God blesses the church who works together. It's really the lesson I want us to learn tonight from this lesson. God blesses the church who works together. I suspect all churches are busy, but some churches are not busy working together and they miss out on great blessings because they have not learned the importance of unity. As we grow together as a family of faith and body of believers, it's incumbent upon us to understand if we want God to bless us as a collective body, we need to work together. That means putting aside personal agendas, putting aside selfish ambitions, even putting aside selfish attitudes that says that I may not agree with everything going on there. If God has called you to a specific place, a specific community and a specific church, and you wanna see that church thrive, you need to have the mindset that says, I'm here to work together with this church so God can bless our efforts. Because as we learn from these individuals in Jerusalem, God blesses the church who works together. So the question is asked, what does it mean to work together? These verses and this chapter shows us two things we must do if we're gonna to work together. First of all, we must work in solidarity, work in solidarity. Let's look again at the first four verses of Nehemiah chapter three. Notice as we look at these verses, Eliashib the high priest, his brother the priests built the sheep gate. In the following verses, we get other individuals who take part in other parts of the gate. We see the, the sons of Hassanah, we see Merimoth, the son of Uriah, and other individuals work together on the gate. Even when you look throughout the entire chapter, you'll discover in verse 22, the priests themselves took part in this rebuilding project. It lets us know that everybody has something to do. Everyone has something to do. When you're in a church, when you're in a community of faith, one person can't do everything, but everybody can do something. And God has gifted us in a way that he has given some individuals tools and talents specific to one part of the church that allows them to function together as a community. Uh, we learn this better in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Matter of fact, let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 18. First Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 18. Here's what Paul says to the Corinthian church. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body each one of them as he chose. Paul tells us that we are one body in Christ, but just as with our physical body, our body has many members. You have two hands, you have two eyes, two ears, you have two feet, different parts of the body that have a different function, but all functions are necessary in order for the body to work. So it is in the life of our church. Everybody can't sing in the choir. 
because if everybody sings in the choir, who's going to be on the usher board? Everybody can't be on the usher board because if everyone is attending to the door, who takes care of the youth and young adults in the church? Everybody can't be for the youth and young adults in the church because if they're taking care of them, who looks out for the senior saints in the church? Everybody has something to do. And too often we get caught up thinking my part is insignificant because it's not visible. Just because I'm not standing on the door, just because I'm not in the choir stand, or just because I'm not in the pulpit, I don't find what I'm doing valuable in order for the body to work as a whole. But I'll contend with you tonight, just because it's not visible does not mean it's not valuable. We need everyone to play a role because everyone has something to do. Just as the case was in Nehemiah chapter three, as these individuals took part of the gate to rebuild, everyone has a part to play and everybody has something to do. And not only that, everybody can accomplish something. As you read Nehemiah chapter three, you'll discover not only did they take part in the rebuilding project, the Bible says they repaired the walls. It didn't matter if it was the priests, didn't matter if it was certain sons or certain men working on it, everybody was able to accomplish something. Which once again lets us know your role in the body of Christ is valuable. We need you to do what God has placed in your heart for us to be a body. Everyone has something that they can accomplish. Whether it be you be part of hospitality, and you simply give out greeting cards or just shake hands. We need you to do that because that accomplishes a great goal. It shows that our church has a smiling face and a welcoming heart as people enter the sanctuary. Whether it's simply you praying from day in and day out, we need that because we need somebody praying for the benefit of our church. Whether it simply is you being there just simply in worship, we need everyone to play a part because everyone can accomplish something. Young or old, rich or poor, black or white, it does not matter. Everyone can accomplish something when it comes to the work of the church. If it's simply cutting the grass, we need somebody to cut the grass. And that accomplishes something because it shows that we're in the process of keeping our campus as beautiful and as clean as possible. Everybody has something to do and everybody can accomplish something. Now that's important to remember because as we look at this idea of solidarity, it reminds us that solidarity does not mean uniformity. Unity does not mean uniformity. Again, as Paul referred to, everybody can't be the I, but we don't need everybody to be the I because if everyone is the I, where's the hearing? Everyone can't be the ear, and we don't need everyone to be the ear because if everybody is the ear, where is the smelling? We need individuals with different talents, with diverse talents to come together to help us work together in our church and in the body of Christ. It's, it's similar to a marriage. Uh, I can speak for my marriage. My wife is totally different than I am. And, and as it's been said before, polar opposites attract. I'm a homebody. I like to stay at home, relax and enjoy my time at the house. My life, my wife lo loves to go out and enjoy some social activities, whether it's go to restaurants, go to movie theaters, uh, experience life as it's presented in the city. But that does not make us any different. It just shows that we have diverse ways of doing it. But what makes our marriage work is that we have one common purpose and one common goal to honor God through marriage. And the same is true for our church. You may be a singer and that's great. Others may be a greeter, and that's great. Some may be an usher, that's wonderful. Others may be a teacher, that's great. But we need ushers, we need singers, we need greeters, we need other individuals in the church who have diverse gifts. And just because we're diverse does not mean we cannot be united. Those gifts need to come together for one common purpose, the glory of God as expressed through our church. And we need as many diverse talents as possible, especially in the times where we are. Uh, this pandemic has shown us church as we have known it won't be church moving forward. There's other elements we need to consider. Virtual discipleship as we're interacting with individuals on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube that we may never see physically in the church. And we need individuals who have expertise in the realm of social media who can help us 
in the efforts of being a virtual church and offering virtual discipleship. Uh, the way that we have communicated before has changed. It used to be you can get everyone in a church for a particular meeting or for a particular reason, but now we have things like conference call, Zoom, and other venues where we have to communicate information differently. And we need people who are experts at conference calling, at Zoom, who can help disseminate information to our church. You need a diverse group of individuals who are coming for the one common purpose, glorifying God through the life of the church. So unity does not mean uniformity. It's okay to have different gifts. It's okay to be diverse. You need both the young and the old. You need both the tech savvy and the non-tech savvy. You need old school and you need contemporary to make it all work together. And as long as we have one common purpose, it doesn't matter our different gifts. We're going to glorify God because we have the one purpose, glorifying God through the life of our church. So what does it mean to work together? It means working in solidarity. Everyone has something to do. You have a role to play. God has given you a talent and a gift that can benefit the life of your church. Everyone can accomplish something. You have something that the church needs and you make the church better by accomplishing what God has placed in your heart to do. And unity does not mean uniformity. Just because we're different doesn't mean we can't be together. God has given us different talents and different gifts that we need to glorify God and work together as a church. So that's what it means to work together. It means to work in solidarity. Secondly, it means to work together. It means to work in silence. It means to work in silence. This is the part where we can exegete the white spaces of Nehemiah chapter 3. As you read the entire chapter, all 32 verses, you'll notice no one murmured or complained. Not once does it say, and the people grumbled about the work. No one was talking during the project. They simply worked on rebuilding the wall. It indicates to us, if God calls you to do it, just do it. There's no need for public statements to say, we're building this or we're doing that. Because as we mentioned last week, and it's true even now, the more you talk about what you're doing, the more opportunity you give enemies and adversaries to attack the work that God is calling you to do. And it raises more opportunity for people to murmur and complain because they don't feel like they're part of the project. If God has called you to do it and the people are together about doing it, just do it. If you know God has called you to mow the lawn at the church campus, don't say, hey, I'm mowing the lawn. Just do it. And know that God honors the work that you're doing by simply doing what God has laid on your heart to do. If God has called you to be part of the hospitality committee and you start sending out birthday cards and uh, get well cards to members who are sick, don't advertise it. Just do it. If God laid on your heart to be part of the music ministry and you feel led to help in the worship experience of the church, don't advertise on Facebook. Hey, I'm going to choir rehearsal or hey, I'm doing this. Just do it. And here's why. Silence shows confidence in God's plan. Oftentimes we think silence is weakness, but really silence is confidence in God's plan because what you respond to indicates what you respect most. What you respond to indicates what you respect most. When we look at back, back at chapter two of Nehemiah, when Sanballat and Tobiah started talking against Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem, notice Nehemiah simply said, God will cause us to prosper. You'll have no place here. And that was the end of the conversation. And Nehemiah spent more time working on rebuilding the wall than he did responding to his enemies because he reverenced God's plan more than he did his enemies' words. And I fear too often we show more reverence for our enemies, for our haters, and their presence in our lives by responding to them instead of simply reverencing God by responding to what he called us to do. And if you spend more time responding to your enemies and what they say, instead of responding to what God has called you to do, it indicates that you respect them more than respect God and his plan for your life. If you spend more time on Facebook 
commenting on somebody else's post who has attacked your character, who has attacked your work, instead of spending time doing what God has told you to do, it indicates that you reverence your enemy's words more than God's call on your life. If you're on Twitter responding to individuals who attack what you're doing in the church or what God has called you to do in your community, opposed to praying and seeking God's face about what God has called you to do, it indicates that you're more concerned and have more reverence about what they say on Twitter than what God has said for your life. If God is for you, if God is your help, if truth is on your side, you can do what God says to do silently and confidently knowing God called me to this and I value what God says more than what my enemy says. And more than that, silence is a great display of the Holy Spirit. Silence is a great display of the Holy Spirit. One of the best displays of the Holy Spirit comes through silence. It reminds me of Exodus as Moses was leading the children of Israel. They were murmuring and complaining as Pharaoh was on their track. They were faced in front of the Red Sea. They had mountains on the side of them and then Pharaoh behind them. And then Moses tells, God tells Moses in the midst of what's going on, tell them to hold their peace. Let me fight their battle. They were murmuring and complaining because they had, they thought they had life better in Egypt. But God reminded them, hold your peace. Let me fight your battle. Stop complaining. Stop murmuring. Stop talking so much and be confident in what I told you to do. And really, that's what it means to operate in silence and work in silence. Sometimes you have to hold your peace. And let God fight your battle. Yes, I know they have attacked your character. Yes, I know that they're saying things on Facebook. And that caused you to feel some type of hurt. It did cause you to feel some type of pain. But sometimes you have to function in the Holy Spirit enough to say, you know what? I'm not going to fight this one. I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to let the Lord fight my battles for me. And too often we think the Holy Spirit is expressed in shouting and speaking in tongues and foaming at the mouth and doing all kinds of things. Sometimes it's proof that you have the Holy Ghost when you can hold your tongue. The best evidence of having the Holy Ghost isn't necessarily you speaking in tongues. It's shown in how you can hold your tongue when enemies are talking against you. So if you're going to work together, if we're going to be blessed as a church, sometimes we need to simply work in silence. If God told us to do it, Let's just do it and know that our silence is not weakness. It's simply confidence in the fact that we trust what God says. We value what God says. We reverence what God says more than we do our enemy's words. And when we do that, we can be like these individuals in Nehemiah 3. We can get the work done. It can be done well. And God honors the efforts that we've placed out because we decided to work in solidarity work in silence and simply do what God has called us to do. And we can watch God build great things in the life of our church. It reminds me of a song that my pastor taught me a few years back. Work together, children, and don't get weary. Talk together, children, and don't get weary. Work together, children, and don't get weary because there's a great camp meeting on the other side. God, our Father, we thank you for reminding us tonight of what it means to work together. Thank you for showing us that we need to work in solidarity. I pray, God, for those who are watching, they be encouraged to know that you have given them a gift and talent that can be used for your glory in the life of their church ministry. Help them to know that what they have is valuable, even though they may not see it as being visible. I pray, God, that you would give them the courage to do what you've called them to do so their church can be accomplished because you have given us many diverse and great gifts in the church and we need all of them to come together for the glory of God. God, help us to work in silence knowing that we reverence what you said more than what our enemies have said. That as you've given us your will for our church, for our lives, we can be confident just to do what you've told us to do and don't have to worry about responding to the criticisms of others. Help us to walk together. Help us to talk together. Help us to love together and work together uh, for the ongoing of your kingdom, but ultimately for the glory of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pray God has blessed you during this lesson. We pray this blessing has blessed you. 
uh, along your journey. If you have been blessed by what you heard tonight and blessed by the ministry of St. Rest, we will encourage you to give as God lays on your heart to do so. Here at St. Rest, we have several methods by which you can give. You can give physically. We have a drop box available on campus where you can drop off or mail in your contributions. We also have electronic means by which you can give. You can give electronically through Givelify, PayPal, Cash App, and Google Pay. Several methods of giving, but the same mentality. God loves a cheerful giver, and I am a living witness. You can't beat God giving, no matter how hard you try, because the more you give, the more God will give to you. So if you feel led to give tonight, we'll encourage you to do so. And please know we'll be good stewards of what God has blessed us through your contributions. Uh, as we're closing tonight, our big announcement, as we've been announcing for several weeks, uh, we're fastly approaching Dr. Harry Blake Day here at St. Rest. We are so excited that this coming Sunday, we will honor God for the life and legacy of Dr. Harry Blake and the influence he had on our church as we unveil our historical marker. It is shaping up to be a very fantastic day in the life of our church, a very historic day in the life of our church, and we look forward to worshiping with you this Sunday at 11 o'clock. So at 11 o'clock, we'll have our worship service, and then we will transition into the unveiling ceremony that will begin at 1230, where we will go outside, unveil our historical marker, and thank God for how he used Dr. Blake to lead us in such a small amount of time. So again, June 13th at 11 o'clock, feel free to join us both in sanctuary or online as we worship God together and thank God for the impact that Dr. Harry Blake made on the St. Rest Church. And we will unveil our historical marker that documents the history of our church in terms of civil rights. As we're closing, several prayer requests demand our attention. We want to pray for Sister Jackie Smith, who is back in the hospital dealing with health complications. We want to keep her lifted in prayer. We want to pray for our former interim pastor, Pastor Lonnie Hamilton, who underwent surgery this past week and is recovering. We're praying that God continues to heal his body. I pray for Sister Gladys Moore and other individuals who have been dealing with sickness. And we want to pray for you. If you feel led, comment and let us know how we can walk with you in prayer. We believe in the power of prayer because God is able. And we know that God will hear and answer his children. God, our Father, as we close tonight in prayer, we thank you for the privilege to cry out to you. We pray, God, your hand of mercy and your hand of healing on those individuals we have mentioned. We thank you for St. Rest. We thank you for what you're doing in our church. We thank you for the growth and love that you are pouring throughout our church. We pray for our members who are dealing with sickness, praying for those who are dealing with other issues. God, we're praying for those who are watching tonight. You know what's on their hearts and minds. Intervene as only you can. Do what no other power can do. And when you do so, help us to be mindful to tell you thank you and give you glory in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.